Mr. McCoy here with part 21 of Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. Get the nets. The doctor turned off the pump. The man with the hose pulled off his mask. As a new wave of rats danced along the edge of the clearing, all three men ran to the truck and from it pulled long-handled nets. But Mrs. Frisbee up on her branch was staring at the blackberry bush again. She saw something that all the others, including the rats, did not see. An eighth rat had come out. He emerged running, but then he stumbled. He got up and ran again, this time more slowly, circling vaguely to the right. He did not seem to know where he was going. He reached a sparse thicket of saplings almost out of her sight, and there, abruptly, he fell over on his side and lay still. Meanwhile, all three men, holding their nets low, ran across the stubble toward the parade of rats. But as they approached the parade, it vanished. The rats, their purpose accomplished, melted into the misty woods, and this time, they did not reappear. Mrs. Frisbee watched them as they loped away swiftly in single file and disappeared from her view, back into the deep forest and up the mountainside. The rear guard was gone, bound for Thorn Valley. But the eighth rat still lay unmoving among the saplings, and two had never come out at all. They're gone, said the man who had worn the mask. They fooled us. What happened? asked Mr. Fitzgibbon, standing near the truck. Simple enough, said the doctor. They had two escape holes, and they used the other one. He walked back to the blackberry bramble and bent down, kicking the branches aside with his foot. Here it is, he said, quite a long tunnel, one of the longest I've seen. To the other men, he said, get the pick and the shovels. For half an hour they dug, laying open a narrow trench along the tunnel. From her angle of view in the tree, Mrs. Frisbee could see only the top of this trench and not down into the bottom. Still she watched, saying to herself, perhaps after all, there were only eight. Maybe they decided that eight would be enough. Then one of the shovels broke through into the air. They had come to the rat's storage room. There's two of them, said one of the men, and her heart sank. Who were they? She wanted to run and look, but she did not dare. So who are these two rats? Share what you think with your fellow listener. Careful, said the doctor. There may still be some gas in there. Let the wind blow it out. Phew, said one of the men. That's not gas, that's garbage. Open it up a little more, said the doctor. One of the men wielded his shovel for another minute, and then the doctor peered in. Garbage, he said. Last night's dinner, garbage and two dead rats. Mrs. Frisbee thought. He sounds disappointed. Only two, said Mr. Fitzgibbon. Yes, it's easy to see what happened. In a hole this size, there would have been a couple of dozen at least, but these two must have been up at the front near the tunnel. They got a whiff of the gas, and it killed them. But before they died, they must have warned the others, so the rest ran out. Warned them, said Mr. Fitzgibbon. Could they do that? Yes, said the doctor. They're intelligent animals. Some can do a great deal more than that. But he did not elaborate. Instead, he turned to one of the men. We might as well take these two back with us. From the truck, the man produced a white paper sack and a pair of plastic gloves. He pulled the gloves on, reached into the hole, and placed the two dead rats into the sack. He did this with his back to Mrs. Frisbee so that she never got even a glimpse of them. All right, said the doctor, let's close it up. They shoveled the dirt back into the trench and returned to the truck. You'll let me know if they have rabies, said Mr. Fitzgibbon. Rabies, said the doctor. Uh, yes, of course, but I doubt it. They look perfectly healthy. Perfectly healthy, thought Mrs. Frisbee sadly, except for being dead. She looked into the woods, over toward the saplings where the other rat lay. Was he, too, now dead? To her surprise, she saw that he was moving, or was he? In the mist, it was hard to tell, but something had moved. 
After the truck had left, Mr. Fitzgibbon stood looking at the ruin of the rose bush. He seemed vaguely puzzled and disappointed. He must be wondering, she thought, whether it had been worth it just to exterminate two rats. He had no way of knowing, of course, that all the rest were also gone and would not return, that his grain loft was safe. In a moment, he turned and walked to the house. As soon as he was safely gone, Mrs. Frisbee scurried down from her tree and into the woods. On the ground, she could no longer see the rat or the thicket where he lay, but she knew the direction, and she ran. Around a stump, over a mound of leaves, past a cedar tree, there were the saplings, and there lay the rat, still on his side. It was Brutus. Beside him, futilely trying to move him, stood Mr. Ages. She reached him, breathless from her run. Is he dead? No, he's unconscious, but he's alive and breathing. I think he'll revive, uh, I think he'll revive if I can just get him to swallow this. Mr. Ages indicated a small corked bottle, no bigger than a thimble, on the ground beside him. What is it? An antidote for the poison. We thought this might happen, so we got it ready last night. He got just a little of the gas, made it this far, and then he collapsed. Help me lift his head. Mr. Aegis had been unable to lift Brutus's head and the bottle at the same time. Now, with Mrs. Frisbee's help, he forced open Brutus's mouth and poured in just a few drops of the smoky liquid the bottle contained. In a few moments, in a few seconds, Brutus made a gulping noise, swallowed hard, and spoke. It's dark, he said. I can't see. Open your eyes, said Mr. Ages. Brutus opened them and looked around. I'm out, he said. How did I get here? Don't you remember? No, wait, yes. I was in the hole. I smelled gas, an awful choking sweet smell. I tried to run, but I stumbled over somebody lying on the floor and I fell down. I must have breathed some of the gas. I couldn't get up. And then? I heard the others running past me. I couldn't see them. It was darker than night. Then one of them ran into me and stopped. He pulled me up and I tried to run again, but I was too dizzy. I, I kept falling. The other one helped me up again and I went a few steps more. He kept pulling me and then pushing and somehow finally I got to the end of the tunnel. I saw daylight and the air smelled better but there was nobody else there. I thought the others must have left, so I ran a little farther, and that's all I remember, Mrs. Frisbee said. What about the one who helped you? I don't know who it was, I couldn't see, and he didn't speak at all. I suppose he was trying to hold his breath. When he got near the inn, and I could see daylight, he gave me one last shove toward it, and then he turned back. He went back? Yes, you see, there was still one rat back in there, the one I stumbled over. I think he went back to help that one. Whoever he was, said Mrs. Frisbee, he never came out. He died in there. Whoever he was, said Mr. Ages, he was brave. A few days later, early in the morning, the plow came through the garden. Mrs. Frisbee heard the chug of the tractor and the soft scrape of the steel against the earth. She watched from just inside her front door, fearfully at first, but then with growing confidence. The owl and the rats had calculated wisely, and the nearest furrow was more than two feet from her house. Behind the plow, in the moist and shining soil, the rudely upturned red-brown earthworms writhed in a frenzy to rebury themselves. Hopping along each furrow, a flock of spring robins tried to catch them before they slid from sight. And when the plowing was done, and the worms had all disappeared, either eaten or safely underground, Mr. Fitzgibbon came back with the harrow, breaking down the furrows, and turned them all up again 
it was a good day for the Robins. After the harrow, for the next two days, came the Fitzgibbons themselves, all four of them with hoes and bags of seeds, planting lettuce, beans, spinach, potatoes, corn, and mustard greens. Mrs. Frisbee and her family kept out of sight. Thoughtfully, Brutus and Arthur had dug their doorway behind a tuft of grass so that not even Billy noticed it. Brutus and Arthur. Mrs. Frisbee did not suppose she would ever see either of them again, nor Nicodemus, nor any of the others. Brutus, after swallowing Mr. Age's medicine and resting for half an hour, had gone on his way into the forest to join the colony in Thorn Valley. There was no talk of their coming back unless their attempt to grow their own food should fail, and she did not believe that that would happen. They were too smart, and even if they did fail, they would probably not come back to Mr. Fitzgibbon's farm. She thought that it would be pleasant to visit them and see their new home, their small lake, and their crops growing, but she had no idea where the valley was, and it would be in any case too long a journey for her and her children. So she could only wonder about them. Were they, at that moment, like Mr. Fitzgibbons, planting seeds behind their own plow? Some, like Isabella's mother, might grumble about the hardness of the new life they had chosen, yet the story of what had happened to Jenner and his friends, if it was Jenner and his friends, to say nothing of the destruction of their own home, would surely help to convince them that Nicodemus's ideas were right. The Fitzgibbons finished their planting, and for a week or two, all was quiet. But it would not stay that way. The crops would appear, the asparagus was ready to sprout, and for the rest of the spring and summer, the garden would be too busy a place for mice to live in comfortably. So on a day in May, as warm as summer, early in the morning, Mrs. Frisbee and her children laid a patchwork of sticks, grass, and leaves over the top of the entrance to their cinder block house, and then carefully scraped earth over it so that it would not show. With luck, they would not have to dig a new one in the fall. They walked to their summer house, taking half a day to do it, strolling slowly and enjoying the fine weather, stopping on the way to eat some new spring leaves of field crest, some young poke greens, and a crisp, spicy mushroom that had sprouted by the edge of the woods. For their main course, a little farther on, there was a whole field of winter wheat, its kernels newly ripe and soft. As they approached the brook toward the big tree in the hollow of those roots, they would make their summer home. The children ran ahead, shouting and laughing. Timothy ran with them, and Mrs. Frisbee was glad to see that he showed no trace of his sickness. It was an exciting time for them. In the garden, they were always alone with themselves, but along the bank of the brook in summer lived five other mice families, all with children. Within a few minutes of arrival, her four had gone with a group of the others down to the water to see the tadpoles swim. Mrs. Frisbee set about the job of tidying up the house, which had acquired a carpet of dead leaves during the winter, and then bringing in a pile of soft green moss to serve as bedding for them all. The house was a roomy chamber with a pleasant earthy smell. Its floor was hard packed dirt and its wooden roof was an arched intertwining of roots above which rose the tree itself, an oak. On her way to get the moss, she saw one of her neighbors, a lady mouse named Janice, who, like herself, had four children. Janice ran over to talk to her. What do you suppose Janice is going to talk to Mrs. Frisbee about? Share what you think with your fellow listener. You're so late getting here, she said. We all thought something must have happened to you. No, said Mrs. Frisbee, we're all fine. But don't you live in the garden? Janice persisted. I should have thought you'd be afraid of the plowing. As a matter of fact, Mrs. Frisbee explained, they didn't plow the particular spot in the garden where we live. It's behind a boulder. You were lucky. That's true. More than that, Mrs. Frisbee did not tell. She had agreed to keep a secret, and she would do it as she had said. 
Still, she thought after quite a long deliberation, it was probably all right to tell her children, first making them promise to keep a secret, after they were, after all, the children of Jonathan Frisbee. For all she knew, and for all Nicodemus knew, they were likely to turn out to be quite different from other mice, and they had a right to know the reason. The following evening, therefore, when they had finished an early supper, she gathered them around her. Children, I have a story to tell you, a long one. Oh, good, cried Cynthia. What kind of a story? A true one. About your father and about the rats. How can it be about father and the rats? Teresa asked. Because he was a friend of theirs. He was? said Martin incredulously. I never knew that. It was mostly before you were born. To everyone's surprise, Timothy said. I thought he might be. I think Mr. Ages was too. How did you know that? I didn't know it. I just thought it. A couple of times I saw Mr. Ages leaving their rose bush, and I knew that Father used to visit him a lot, but I never saw him near the rose bush. Probably, Mrs. Frisbee thought, because he would have been careful always to leave through the blackberry bramble, just so we would not see him. They sat down outside the entrance to the house, and beginning at the beginning, with her first visit to the rats, she told them all that she had seen and done, and all that Nicodemus had told her. It took a long time to tell them, and as she talked, the sun sank low, turning the sky red and lighting the tops of the mountains, beyond which, somewhere, the rats of Nim were living. The children's eyes grew round when she told them about the escape from Nim, and even rounder when she described her own capture and escape from the birdcage. But in the end, the eyes of Teresa and Cynthia were filled with tears, and Martin and Timothy looked sad. Teresa said, But mother, that's terrible. It must have been Justin. He saved Brutus, and then went back, and he was so nice. Mrs. Frisbee said, It may have been Justin. We can't be sure. It could have been one of the others. Martin said, I'm going to find out. I'm going to go to the Thorn Valley somehow, someday. But it's too far, and you don't know where it is. No, but I'll bet Jeremy knows. Remember, he told you the rats had a clearing back in the hills. They must be in Thorn Valley. He thought about this for a minute, then he added, he might even fly me there on his back, the way he did you. But you don't know where Jeremy is. We don't see the crows down here. Mrs. Frisbee reminded him. No, but in the fall, when we go back to the garden, I could find him then. If I could find, if I got something shiny and put it out in the sun, he'd come to get it. Martin was growing excited at this idea. Oh, mother, may I? How do you think Mrs. Frisbee is going to respond to Martin's question? Share what you think with your fellow listener. And now, the conclusion of Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. I don't know. I doubt that the rats will want visitors from the outside. They wouldn't mind. After all, you helped them, and so did Father. And I wouldn't do any harm. It's not something we have to decide tonight, said Mrs. Frisbee. I'll think about it. And now it's late. It's time for bed. The sun had set. They went into the house and lay down on the soft moss Mrs. Frisbee had placed on the floor of their room under the roots. Outside, the brook swam quietly through the woods, and up above them, the warm wind blew the newly opened leaves of the big oak tree. They went to sleep. That marks the conclusion of Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, but our next tale will be just as interesting. Be prepared for great things.